Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. This week, Board Game Breakfast is gonna be recorded a different way because of Hurricane Irma, which probably has hit us by now, except we're running from it. See, the vassals are fleeing. I'm not driving, by the way, Laura. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm sure Board Game Breakfast is amazing this week. Lots of things to talk about. I will be recording in different places. <laughs> um, we'll see what happens as time goes by. So anyway, are you ready for the news? I am. Let's get to it. Right, folks, by the way, if you're wondering why the quality of the videos aren't the way they are, it's because we're recording this on my phone. Forgot to bring a camera with me. Um, but anyhow, uh, let's get to the news. Knoxford is coming from QSF Games, Quick Simple Fun Games. This is a steampunk uh, themed game in which you're tiling, but you're using cards. And one thing I found interesting, it looks like the cards are not necessarily all placed the same direction. So I'm hoping that's a good sign for this game. Raxon. We talked about Raxon in the past. Raxon was a game that had viral marketing where you got Raxon and then other people, you would send out invitations to other people. Well, that was just kind of the pre-release. It's actually having a full release from Plat Hat Games in October. Uh, this is a game that's about a virus. It's set in the Dead of Winter universe. In fact, two Dead of Winter characters come with this game, so people will probably buy it just for that alone. Aftermath, this is an expansion for Cry Havoc, is coming out at Essen. We knew they were coming out with an expansion. This is just confirmation. It's gonna have more cards, leaderboards, more structures, just more stuff, essentially. So that's kind of exciting to see these four very different uh, factions even more differentiated. Harvest Dice, this is a game from Gray Fox. I'm really liking the artwork on this one. Even it does a little bit like Veggie Garden, but Harvest Dice is a roll and write style game. That's where you write on the boards with erasable markers. Looks fun. I hope it is. Noria. This is a game from Stronghold Games. Um, and the artwork here, Michael Menzel, Clemens Franz, really good. Uh, the, I don't know how else about the game. There's auctioning and negotiation maybe, but it looks cool. Um, so that's coming out next year, I believe. 8-Minute Empire now has an app version. I mention this because it's a really nice-looking app version uh, from Ryan Lockett Games. Uh, a new version of Manhattan is coming from Mandu. I actually saw this at Gen Con, tried to steal it several times. Not really, but wanted to. It's really pretty, translucent buildings. The whole thing looks really good. And then we have Pandemic Rising Tide. Now, this was kind of announced two weeks ago, then they pulled it because they didn't want to be insensitive to the folks in... Um, the first hurricane, not our hurricane, uh, Harvey in Texas. But it's not really about that at all. It's about the dikes and uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so uh, you're trying to, water's coming in, you're trying to stop it by building dikes. Uh, but the biggest thing about this one is Jerrowen Domian, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, is one of the designers. Now you may not have heard of him, but he is one of the main designers from Splatter Games. Roads and boats and things like that. So. Is this gonna be a more complex pandemic game? We'll have to wait and see. Anyway, that's the news. Let's keep going. Happy breakfast, everybody. From the libraries of Alexandria to the Old West, today's campaigns take us to a variety of adventurous places. So let's take a look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. Emergence Dark Ops is a standalone follow-up to Emergence, but the games can also be combined. Using simultaneous action selection mechanisms, players move around the modular board, collecting resources to upgrade their abilities or for endgame points. But there are also hidden agendas, including a target player that you're secretly working to thwart, and of course, someone's trying to hinder you too. Alliances will be made and broken, and there's a prisoner's dilemma mechanism when a player wants to activate their dark ops for a big boost. And winning is also tied to tokens that are collected on the board that are used to vote for mission success and failure. Emergence Dark Ops has modern graphic design and is a step up in components from the previous edition featuring six custom player minis, and you can get a copy of the game for a pledge of $39 plus shipping. Zapang Portable is a quick tactical card game based on the idea of being warriors fighting for honor. 
The mechanisms are straightforward as players have just a couple of cards in hand to manage as they use them to attack neighbors or for their special powers. Playing super quickly, under 30 minutes a game, Zapang Portable is simple enough for younger players or it serves as a light filler for adults. Without a doubt, the lovely Japanese ukiyo-e style art elevates the gameplay experience and you can get a copy of Zapang Portable for a pledge of just $19 plus shipping. Doomtown Reloaded There Comes a Reckoning is an expansion for the twice-killed fantasy western-themed card game. The publisher of the popular Deadland series has resurrected this collectible card game turned trading card game. Using poker as a foundational mechanism, Doomtown Reloaded was loved as a CCG and TCG, and fans appreciated its theme, deck-building options, and overall depth of play. There Comes a Reckoning expansion features four sets of 24 brand new cards that support all six factions, and there's also a new type of powerful card called Legends. Additionally, rules have been streamlined and clarified, and this is great for fans of the game who thought the game had ceased its run. A number of stretch goals have already been unlocked, and you can get the expansion-only cards for a pledge of $25 plus shipping. Or if you want to dive in big time, the mother load level includes the base game, all previously published expansions, and more. Ancient Artifacts is a roll and write game that plays one to four players. Thematically, players are adventurers exploring for relics through three different locations. D6 dice determine the region and type of action you'll take on the shared atlas board, and custom D6 will help you complete the sections on your personal career sheet as you dig, research, and explore. Raiders can block you out of regions, and there's this cool follow-on mechanism that lets players pay a dollar to copy the active player's action. Ancient Artifacts is mechanically simple but provides some really great decision points, push your luck elements, and the graphic design and art look great. You can get a copy that includes those custom results dice for $28 plus shipping. And last but not least, Alexandria Library in Cinders revisits that historical library and its destruction. Players take on the role of unique characters, each of whom has their own motivations and abilities in the form of player boards and individual decks. Characters move throughout the library, interact with the rooms to pick up books and take on other actions, and they can also impact each other. Actions cost time, but depending on location, you can take opponents' time to complete them. And of course, the library is burning down around everyone, shrinking the board and the options. And if the room a character is in burns, their unique destiny response kicks in. Alexandria has creative mechanisms and features beautiful art by Vincent Dutre, and there's an optional deluxe edition that includes custom wood tokens. But the basic copy of Alexandria Library and Cinders takes a pledge of just $29 plus shipping. Okay, that's all I've got for you this episode. And to all of my friends out there who are dealing with weather wackiness, I hope that you are all safe and sound with your loved ones. Please take care, and until next time, I hope you have a good week. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here. And you know what? Every now and then in your board gaming career, you will come across a game with something incorporated into it that is so strange, so unique, that you can really only discuss it after first showing a custom-made title card to introduce it. And that's why we present Brilliant or Bumbling Board Game Designs. You decide. That's right. We take a look at 1992's Gangsters. This is a game published by Avalon Hill and brought to my attention by viewer Jake B. Now, on the surface, Gangsters may seem just like your old school typical cops versus mobsters game of accumulating money through dubious means while occasionally gunning down your enemies. And they would be right. Well, mostly. Because yes, in this game, players will be recruiting gangsters into their family to increase the strength of their criminal empire, spreading their influence across the city, and periodically having their ranks thinned out by engaging in dice-driven gang warfare against their opponents or the cops in bloody, bloody shootouts. Typical gangster stuff. But even so, that's not what makes this game worthy of whatever I eventually decide this segment is going to be called. Nope. That badge of honor is earned because in addition to all the game's standard components, 
cards, dice, play money, movement pawns, etc. Each and every copy of this game also included a fully functional squirt gun. Because nothing goes together with finely printed paper and cardboard components better than streams of stagnant tap water haphazardly discharged across the room at one another while you play. Now, love it or hate it, you, you gotta admit that incorporating a squirt gun into your game is, is pretty unique. So, I wanna know, how is the squirt gun utilized in gangsters? Well, quote, each time that a player loses a strength point in a shootout, he may be shot with the squirt gun as an added incentive to avoid gang wars or shootouts with the cops. And... that's it. That is all it does. Avalon Hill was willing to shell out an extra $1.95 in production costs per copy of this game just to give players the opportunity to dampen their opponents. Was this a commendable effort in game design? An innovation ahead of its time? Or just a gimmick to sell more games to the summertime recreational water sports community? I don't know. But maybe you do. So tell me what you think in the comments below, and if you know of any games that include rules or pieces that are puzzling, I'd love to hear about them and perhaps cover them in a future installment of whatever this is that I've just done. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? <laughs> Nothing. Sorry. Probably not. Um, there's not even going to be an audio podcast. Uh, we were on the run. The fact that we're getting board game breakfast out is a good thing, I think. But no week in review, no reviews probably. Even if the storm misses Miami, which it looks like it, Miami's not going to take a full hit, we still will likely be without power. We're still going to have to clean up. We still have to get back. If I can make it, I'm going to try to get to Grand Con this week because I'm supposed to be going to Grand Con. So all that combined... Yeah, there's just not going to be anything from Dice Tower. There might be a few other videos from other contributors that will show up on the channel. And I apologize about that, but here's the good news. We have almost 10,000 videos you can go back and watch if you missed them. So there's that. Um, thanks so much for keeping an eye on us and for all the nice wishes from everybody. Let's keep going. Hello everyone, my name is Annette and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Apply Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Zooscape. So Zooscape is a three to six player game and it plays fairly quickly. It has the interesting I split, you choose mechanism. So let me show you how it works and what I really like about it. So in Zooscape, you have this beautiful set of cards, which are different animals that have escaped from the zoo. They all are worth different valued points and some of them have special actions along with just negative points. So what you're trying to do is collect these cards for their valued points. However, there is a limit to how many of those particular types that you can have. For example, if you have more than one giraffe card, then each card will be worth negative one point. So one player is going to play a manager and they're going to pick and choose how to split the set of cards by making a first group and a second group for the players to choose from. Every player has a first and second card to choose from. They're going to secretly pick whether they want the first group or the second group by keeping one of these cards face down. Players will simultaneously reveal which group they want. If no one picks a certain group, then all of those cards will go under the clipboard. If one person picks that group, then they will keep all of those cards. If multiple players pick that group, then they will decide again how to split that set of cards. And then you just keep on continuing with the game of I split and you choose. So as you can see, the I split you choose mechanism is fun for everyone. The manager is always trying to figure out how to split the choice of cards. And also, if you're not the manager, you're trying to figure out which group you should pick. There's always a sense of bluffing in the game because people know exactly what you're trying to collect. Therefore, they know more than likely you're going to go for a certain group. And that outwitting is always fun in this game. And that's why I really like Zooscape. Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye! Two brothers set loose in a thrift store. This is Thrift Store Throwbacks. Hello. My name's Nick from the Brothers Murph. You might know us from Board Game Breakfast and our silly sketches and a review of thrift store board games. But we're here to tell you now that we're above all that. 
we don't need those parlor tricks and those silly shenanigans anymore because we have MindFlex. That's right. Because here at MindFlex, we learn to unlock our true potential. And that's flexing the mind. And maybe we collect a little bit of data while it's connected to you. But don't worry about that, because it's a game. Don't you want to play a game? Just remember less is more. I am all powerful. I have unlocked my truest potential. Master does not need his senses, but only the mind. Flex my mind. Yes. Yes, rise. Get that ball up. Ah! So that was Mind Flex. What do you think of this game? I don't know, man. I, I still have no idea how to make the ball go higher. Like, there, I'm like, the times you see me like struggle, I think, I'm really thinking so hard. I'm just like, just like, and I, like, I assume it has to do with the amount of like blood in your brain. So I would just literally be like, they try to force as much blood <laughs> in my like head as possible. Red, like, it's I super no weird. Idea. This <laughs> thing on Amazon, by the way, is like $90. Don't, don't pay that. And we saw an ad that said, this is a future board gaming. <laughs> We're like, is it? I'm going to go ahead and declare that. No, it is not. Do check us out on social media and all the places below. Also, make sure to check out our segment on Throat Punch Lunch. And until next time, we'll see you at the thrift store. We'll see you there. Talking about with like my third eye. Okay, folks. Today, I want to talk about hurricanes. Not really, but a lot of people ask me, for example, to like, what's the top 10 games you take with you on a hurricane? Well, I actually know the answer now because what did I bring with me? And the answer is pretty much nothing. Now, don't get me wrong, I brought two bags worth of review games that I was gonna review. I knew I was gonna cool stuff and I said if I have a chance to review these games and play these games while they're there, that's not gonna be a problem. But what about games my collection? Like, what are the top 10 games that you would keep from your collection in case your house was gonna be destroyed? And the answer for that is zero. Really? Um, when I loaded up my van and came up here, uh, we thought that our houses, at least my house and the studio, we thought they might, they might survive. So we put some very valuable things in, away so that they hopefully wouldn't get destroyed. And, uh, but the rest of the games, you know, we didn't really bag, box them up or anything. Z is a little bit more concerned about his place, so he brought over some more of his more valuable games. But for me, here's the deal. My games, I like them. I love games. But games are just that. They're entertainment. They're games. I brought with me some computers. Computers are expensive. I put the cameras that we have in, in the safest place that I could put them in. Um, I brought with me some other stuff. But if, let's say I thought my house was actually going to be destroyed. And of course, it still might be, I guess. But let's say I thought it wasn't be destroyed. If I was making a list of things to bring, games would still not be on that list. What's the most important thing to bring? Obviously my family, get them in the car. What else do we bring? Clothes, food, you know, uh, again, computers and some devices for entertainment, I guess. But we, that is what it's important. If I knew my house was to be destroyed, what else would I grab? I would grab the box of cards and all the things from Jack and Sonny that we have, the, the two kids that we lost, I would keep that box because that means a lot to me. I might grab a few small mementos. I'd probably grab a couple hats, you know, but really it's just stuff. Stuff, I don't need stuff. And that's kind of weird from us because this is a, a show where we talk to you and we say, you should buy these games for entertainment. But when the end of the day comes, games are entertaining and they're great. And when this hurricane hits here soon, we're gonna play games probably because it's one way to stay entertained during a hurricane. But games are not more important than humans even in the slightest. And games aren't even higher than other stuff so many times. So you say, Vassal, come on, give me games you would really take in a hurricane. All right, so let's say I had time and room 
And for some reason, I was taking games with me. What games would I bring? I would bring Domain. Why would I bring Domain? Because that's a game that has a special place for me because my wife went and hunted down a copy of that, had no idea what she was doing, went down to Seoul, found a board game cafe, found this game on a list that I had somewhere, and got it for me. That means a lot to me. I would bring Robot Turtles because Robot Turtles is the, one of the first games where my daughter Claire, I saw her making decisions that really mattered in it. And it was such a, a really good moment for me, so I'd bring that. I'd bring some kids games because my kids and I, we're gonna be playing games together for the rest of the time. I'd probably bring Duel of Ages because my daughter Melody and I have had so much fun playing stories in that particular game. I don't know that I would bring my favorite games because those games are, are replaceable. I would bring games that meant something to me at different points in time because of this, or maybe a game that someone gave me as a gift, or maybe a game that has painted miniatures, I don't know. But the fact is, they're just games. Hey folks, I really appreciate everybody. I mean, there's so many people who have uh, sent us nice notes and everything, and stay safe. I push my luck in games, guys. I do not push my luck in real life. All right, we wanna be safe here. We are gonna stay inside here in Orlando during the hurricane and when it's over, hopefully go back to Miami and pick up the pieces and keep going. But I do appreciate a few people who have sent us some money too to help with our travel expenses. Very, very nice of you guys um, to help out in that regard. Uh, the Dice Tower will recover from this. Of course, it's rain, it's wind, but Floridians, we stay strong. Let's keep going. So in this episode, we're gonna be answering a few birthday requests. So let's see what we got. Hi, I'm Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and this is what should I get where we go on the board game subreddit and go under the daily personalized game recommendation. Go ahead and recommend games for people. So, let's go ahead and see what we got. Toasted Tree is looking for a game for their brother in law, and they're basically trying to get a game that's either complicated or fairly simple that can handle two to six players. Now, noticing on their post, it didn't look like any of the games that they own were actually very complicated, so this one I'll giving. I'll dip their toes in the water by getting them sight. It's one of those games that if you've learned from watching videos online rather than reading the rule book, it's actually a very easy, very straightforward game, but it becomes very complicated the more you play it and the more strategies you learn. And plus, it's one of those games that's dead simple to teach people to once you understand how it works. We is looking for a present for someone in their game group. They want a game that's roughly around five players and then their budget is roughly around 60 bucks. Also, they really want to focus on getting cooperative games because it's something that their group hasn't dived into yet. So because you're trying to get competitive players into playing playing cooperative games, I suggest doing one of three things. I suggest either getting a one versus all game like Spectre Ops for example, so then at least one player is playing competitively still if they're really trying to fight playing cooperative games. I'd also suggest getting both Pandemic and Mysterium because they're both within your price range. I'd also suggest buying a bunch of one shot games such as the Escape Room games or a Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, games like that. You could probably buy at least four of them for the price of 60 bucks. And Orbital Comics looking for a game to get their friend who's just just getting into board games. So what I'll suggest you get for this one is the <laughs> the birthday was yesterday. Uh, so it's kind of too late then. Um, all right, so I mean, my bad on that one. But uh, the, the game would have been Spheres of Influence. And that was another episode, what should I get? Be sure to post your questions on the board game subreddit underneath the daily personalized game recommendation. And people like myself and a ton of others will go ahead and suggest games for you. And this is Gary Pope from Late to the Table, and I hope you're enjoying your breakfast. It is heading to Florida. It is going to make landfall in the Keys. Hi everyone. This week the news was of course all about Hurricane Irma. How much devastation this hurricane category 5 when it hit St. Martin. It just got downgraded to a category 4 which is still unbelievable and right now it's still heading straight for Florida. It's nice to have friends all over the world, have colleagues and, and people you know but right now I can only wish that everyone is safe. I just saw the pictures of what the hurricane did to St. Martin. 95% of the island is damaged, is ravaged. <sighs> Unbelievable. But like Tom said in one of his earlier videos this week, he's going to Orlando and if you live there then you might have a chance to game with him. So there's always a upside to a downside situation. Kind of. This week I have been playing a game that was new to me. I got it at Gen Con and is all about being a first responder to a scene of magnitude. This week I am playing 
Paramedics clear. In paramedic clear, you are a paramedic and you're trying to save lives. You are going to get patients on your board and you try to help them. Help them as fast as you can because you are under a constant pressure of time. The game is played in three shifts and in the first shift you have one minute to get rid of one or two patients or try to help them as best you can and then the next player has got one minute and then the next player has got one minute until it comes back to you and you try to frantically be as quick as you can. But the next shift you only have 45 seconds to do the same thing and in the third shift you only have 30 seconds so you're gonna make mistakes and Patients are bound to, well, not survive. So that's kind of the game. You're constantly trying to get the right medicine and uh, trade, trade cards and maybe uh, make your medicine cabinets bigger so you can have uh, more medicine already done before it's too late. It is a quick and fun game and you might want to check it out. I will be doing a playthrough of the game with my wife. so. That's it, that's paramedics. I hope everyone is safe and I will see you all next week. Hey everyone, it's lunchtime. Today we're gonna to be talking about Glux. Glux is designed by Jakub Andrush, published by Queen Games. It plays two to four players ages eight and up in about 30 minutes. So in Glux, this game can get pretty mean. <laughs> but what you're trying to do is you're trying to get your pieces on the board and configure them in a way that you're getting points in these big squares on the board. So what you want to do on your turn, oh, shake that up, draw one of your, what they look like, dice or a die, and you get two sides on the die. There's a two numbers. And you get to choose which number you'd like to use. However, you need to place it next to an existing piece on the board. Ideally, trying to get into these kind of square areas. So if, for example, I had a six here, I can count six from there orthogonally. So one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I would place my token here either on the four side in this case or the three. Keeping in mind, we're trying to get into these blue squares and we need to count from tokens that we've already placed on the board. So what else am I missing, Tracy? Well. Scoring. Yes. It's all about majorities. So with majorities, what you're doing is every single area that's lit up is going to be scored and you're counting up the pip values of your color. Most pips obviously gets majority and then second place also scores. So it's four and two points depending. This was a surprisingly strategic game. I mean, it looks fairly simple at, at first, but <laughs> you get to two thirds of the way through the game and you're having, you're struggling to find a place to legally place your pips. Well, especially when, you know, you're getting covered because yes, you can cover other players only up to two stacks high. That's a hard thing or people blocking your path. You can't go over ones that are already placed. Exactly, and this, this game is not for the faint of heart. If you're gonna play timidly, you're gonna lose, yeah. that's all I'm gonna say. This, this is where my cutthroat be comes out. Be, be <laughs> aggressive. Yeah, literally, you need to have that mentality playing at this game. I do like that when you flip it to the other side for a smaller player count, that the board does shrink a little bit, uh -huh. so mm -hmm. get a little bit more competitive, but better for two players. So exactly. I like this one, I was a bit surprised. I did too. The, the, the name Glux, it kind of, I'm like going, <laughs> uh, it kind of <laughs> sits there and I'm like, but yes, the gameplay, fantastic. Yeah, so I think this is definitely a winner in our group mm -hmm. and uh, that's it for now, so we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Hi, Mike Lisio from Solo Mode Games. Last week I talked a little bit about setup and teardown time and how that was becoming a bit of an issue for me and I asked if other people were having the same issue. I got a few comments I wanted to talk about really briefly. Uh, Ray Myers said that he thought it might be a good idea to set the game up the night before. That way you don't have that extended time of setup and then trying to play the game. That's an interesting idea. Connor Sutton said that he found that it was less of an issue for him to set up a game that takes a while if it was for multiplayer. He wasn't as likely to do it for himself, and I tend to agree with that. Uh, Steve Wyshynski said that he might choose a game that's going to have a long setup time if he plans on playing it three or four times in a row, and that might just have that out for the whole week on his table. And so those are some really interesting comments, and it got me thinking, what are some solo games that I think are give you a good bang for the buck for the amount of game for short setup and teardown time. So really briefly, I want to talk about quickly some games. Um, I think Sagrada 
is a really good choice for a quick setup, quick teardown, and a good game. Roll Player is another one that's a little bit longer on setup because you have some cards, but still uh, a lot of bang for your buck there. Explorers of the North Sea, I mention this almost every time. I just love this game so much, especially uh, with the amount of time it takes. It doesn't take many, much time at all. Coffee Roaster is another great solitaire-only game that doesn't have a tremendous amount of setup because the uh, insert for the box does so much of the sorting for you. And then finally, Pocket Mars is a great little card game that plays quickly, almost no time in setting up, but there's a lot of decisions to be made in that little short amount of time. So let me know, what are some of your favorite games that have a really short setup and teardown time, but a lot of game to it, solo or multiplayer? I'd love to find out. Let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day. All right, folks, Catanathon's coming up soon, so I thought we'd get a game going to uh, practice up on the rules. So, uh, what's that? Uh, this is the game you played for like 26 consecutive hours this time last year? Yeah, no, that's not ringing a bell. Uh, legendary industry changing strategy game, Settlers of Catan, winner of the 1995 Spiel des Jahres, uh, designed by. Uh, Dentist turned legendary board game designer Klaus Teuber. Praise be his name. Uh, nope. But maybe we should give this new fangled board game a try? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, I can't seem to find the robber. What's the robber? Well, we can't play without it. Can we just use a meeple instead? Steve. We can't just use a meeple for Catanathon. We'll be the laughing stock of the board game community. Let's check the back of the rules. There's normally a phone number or something you can call. Huh. Seems like it's a little more complicated than making a phone call. What do you mean? Well, it looks like you have to get the replacement part from Klaus Teuber himself. Oh my god, is his number in there? Is he single? It's not quite like that. So, what do we have to do? Uh, looks like we have to gather all the resources together. And then... And then... something happens. Well, that's easy enough. They're right there on the table. Just pick them up and put them together? Uh, I think it means you got to get them, like, for realsies. Like a quest? I'll find the stone. I'll get wheat. I'll get hard mud. I'll get wood. Sheep! All right, gang, let's go. It's a wheat beer. Where am I gonna find a sheep in Toronto, if not High Park? Mm, close enough. Buy this stuff in Canada, huh? Yeah, who knew? Hello, my name's Dan, and this is Cora, and we're here today to talk to you about board games for children, around five and under. Apart from, we're not here to talk to you about board games for five and under, because we're here to talk to you about gaming accessories for children of five and under. Because today... Or every age, really. Or every age, really, because I use them too. Because we're talking about these things. What's this, Cora? It's a card holder. What do you use it for? Holding cards. Holding cards. <laughs> 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 I'm glad you do it. It's a card holder. Oh. So, do you find these useful, Cora? 
Yeah, because if you want to keep your card secret, yeah. if you're allowed in the game, you can just do with that. Your hands are too small to hold them like that, aren't you? There are other solutions available. Game right do a kind of fan. Or thing. you can use it like this to do it there. Yeah, you can use it as a shield to put your cards down, can't you? Yeah, like that. Yeah, and as I say, Game Right do a fan thing that you can use, but I prefer these. People ask me where I got them from, and I, I, to be honest, I think I bought them on eBay or Amazon or something like that, but if you search for card holders, um, or children's card holders, or something like that, I'm sure they'll pop up. Sometimes you can get them in other games, though, as well. I've got a game over here. Hanabi Extra, um, which is just Hanabi with big cards really, but it does come with, with these plastic ones. So they're the same thing, aren't they? But that's better because it's longer and it's curved. Um, so, so we really recommend these card holders, as I say, freely available, quite cheap on that, um, Amazon. Highly recommended for anyone wanting to play any kind of card game with any kits. So we give the card holders to... Um, what kind of thumbs up does card holders get? I don't know. Straightforward, normal thumbs up. Okay. Two straightforward, normal thumbs up. Some things just don't bother you. You see them time after time, and you don't like them, but they just don't bother you. Like a peppy, awkward YouTube type up start. And then it happens one more time, and you snap. And you go all, what do you mean you're not serving breakfast? Let me let you into a little secret. A lot of these boxes are way bigger than they need to be. And yeah, I get it. Shelf presence is an important factor, but I have a sneaking suspicion it's just publishers trying to convince us that what's in those boxes is worth more. You know, like with perfume or printer ink or this house. I mean, I live in a very small house, but Everything above head height could probably go for a start. This is a TV area. That over there is the breakfast nook. And over here is where you'll be living, which is great. Because till now, it's just been wasted space. Kerala, that elephant tile laying game, which is actually really good, comes in a ticket to size ride box. And what they miss out is that Kerala would fit into this. In fact, the copy I played, my friend had put it into a bag, just like this. And that, my friends, is some nonsense right there. And don't even get me started on Machikoru. What? Just, no. So what games do you think are the worst offenders? Let me know in the comments below. See ya. And also, side note, these are the two best box sizes. All right. All right, folks, that's it. A shorter board game breakfast. Obviously, don't have all my segments that I would normally do, but the contributors sent stuff in, so yay! All right, folks, probably board game breakfast is gonna be late next week. Probably you'll see videos next week. I don't know. Everything's up in the air. Keep an eye on Twitter, keep an eye on our YouTube. We might do some live stuff. But realize, again, we might be without internet and such. We don't know. It's pretty outside right now, but the rain, she's coming. We'll see you guys next time. Until then, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.